Houghton or about three inch, two, three inches um, on Sunday. Uh, and, uh, and, and it was, it was cold enough for it to stick around. It's 55 today though, which is kind of pretty typical for, I think, you know, temperature oscillations are such that you can't really count on your lawn not having snow on it at this, at this time of year. So um, welcome to Husky Bites. Husky Bites is a webinar series, um, an educational webinar series featuring many of our Michigan Tech faculty and some of our alumni. And this evening, we're gonna be hearing from um, uh, one of the faculty in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. And my co-host this evening is Will Cantrell, who is the Dean of, of the Graduate School. And I'll be formally introducing him in a second. Um, but right now, what I wanna do is I wanna share my screen Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. I'm going to um, share screen. And, uh, and then I want to present this. So again, welcome. Welcome to Husky Bytes. Uh, it's wonderful to see you. If anyone needs to contact me or would like to contact me, that my email is just callahan at mtu.edu. I really wanna deeply acknowledge um, and thank our sponsors, Peter and uh, Anita Sandretto. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your sponsorship. Um, we, um, if, if anyone would like to sponsor a Husky Bites, uh, we are 100% of it goes to student scholarships here at Michigan Tech uh, and it's the general, general student scholarship. So you can, or if you'd rather you can give directly to your department and just let us know. Uh, and the reason I'm saying this is that we have a matching gift and we are, we need to kind of work on this. So if anyone has any intention of giving, what, what do we need there about? I don't know, what is that, $18,000? Um, please let me know <laughs> and that would endow, that would uh, certainly award a bunch of, of student scholarships. And this is directions of how to give. And thank you, Michael and Karen Gregory for your matching gift. And I hope you'll give us patience filling this. All right, so I wanna also point out um, welcome and welcome our K-12 educators because um, uh, this is turns out to be a way that you can earn sketches, which are a state continuing ed clock hour. Uh, and so if you are an educator and it's your first time here, please, please let us know that you're an educator by sending us an email to engineering at mtu.edu. As you all know, we do um, also stream this on Facebook Live. Just look for the College of Engineering and uh, you can also just watch us there. So we're coming down to the wire. We have three left after this evening and I'm looking forward so much to this evening. Um, uh, our, uh, and I'll talk about next week's in just a moment, but uh, the, the one on April 12th um, features our one of our, our our Michigan Tech's famous enterprise programs. So enterprises are um, multiple year opportunities for students to work on real world projects. And uh, the the um, the uh, ad advisor for the wireless communication enterprise is Kit Siski, uh, and he um, will be my co-host, and it'll be featuring a student team. And so I'm looking forward to that so much. And then our last one of the season is um, Jared Wolf from the College of Forest Resources and Environmental Science uh, with co-host Eric. Uh, and he's gonna be talking about multi, M-O-L-T-I, colored migratory birds. Um, it, it has, it connects migration with, I wanna say multation, but I don't think it's the word, molting. Um, and then uh, of course, summer youth programs are available for registration and um, do be aware if you are an alum, uh, your children and grandchildren are eligible for the legacy awards. So this is next week's uh, next week's topic. Very much looking forward to it. Um, uh, this will be featuring uh, one of our professors here at the university, Adam Meckler, who is in the Department of Visual and Performing Arts. He is also the director of jazz studies. Um, he'll be talking about making it in the new music economy, kind of referring to what's been going on in the pandemic. And I'm sure he'll play something live. Uh, uh, you know, Adam is is always a lot of fun. Uh, all right, so I'm gonna stop sharing and um, um, I see Tim is back, which is great. And so at this point, what, I'm, what I'd like to do is introduce my co-host, um, we'll formally introduce my co-host, Will Cantrell. Dr. Cantrell is a professor of physics. He is also the graduate dean or the dean of the graduate school here at Michigan Technological University. 
uh, uh, Will, or, or Dr. Cantrell, earned his BS at Washington University in St. Louis. He then went on to get his PhD in Alaska uh, at U Alaska Fairbanks. So Will loves to fly fish. He loves clouds. He does cloud physics. That's his research area. And uh, Will was, Will, Will, well, I won't say any much more about Will because I know we want to save a lot of time for our featured speaker. So Will, can you take it from here, please? Yes, thanks, Janet. Um, th thank you for asking me to co-host again. I, I really enjoyed this uh, and I'm looking forward to Tim's presentation. So I, I appreciate you giving me the chance to do that as well. Um, so if you turned in early or tuned in early, you uh, found out that Tim grew up in St. Louis, which is something that I did not know. Um, Tim received graduate degrees from the University of Southern California and then went back to St. Louis for um, his um, terminal degree to, uh, and this is something that we share in common. We're both alumni of Washington University in St. Louis. And actually, Tim, I looked at your bio and we missed overlapping by about a year. Uh, you graduated from WashU about a year before I started there as a first year student. My, my undergraduate degree is Washington University, Tim's uh, graduate degree is Washington University. Tim is a former chair in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering here at Michigan Tech and is a former dean in the College of Engineering. Is now a university professor and a couple of points to note about Tim. If you Google him on YouTube, you will find some of the best videos on computer circuits that are out there. In fact, I have referred to some of those videos when I have been teaching electronics for scientists in physics. So Tim, I, I appreciate um, the, the time and effort that you put into those as well. Tim is also an author, and I'm not gonna say very much about that because I think he's going to uh, talk more about the book uh, that he has written and then one that's coming out here pretty soon, both of uh, which are either available now or will be available soon on Amazon. And Tim's topic today is, um, broadly speaking, fly fishing in the Upper Peninsula. Tim, please. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, well, you know, as you point out, I, I uh, uh, this is cliche, and I promise not to do too many cliches today, but uh, I, uh, uh, I do wear different hats, right? I, I'm a, a professor. For a while, I wore that administrator hat, uh, uh, writer hat, and, uh, but I also wear a fishing hat. And, uh, uh, and just to prove it, I, I'm going to do it, and I'm going to take advantage of something that happened here. Is, uh, this is my fishing hat, and I'm going to show it to you a little closely, and you're going to see. I want to tell you that's like that's not what it looks like. I don't think there are any birds flew over me, but uh, this is the hat, and uh, and I, I I got to bring it in today. My my wife doesn't normally let this hat come in this house, and uh, uh, it's uh, oh, I I, I got to tell you I love the smell of it, so I'm going to wear it, and uh, and I'm going to wear this hat. I'm going to literally be wearing a fishing hat for this this presentation, and I guess what I need to do is share a screen now. Is that right? And, uh, and we'll you do, going. you do, but Tim, you're going to have to wash your head afterwards. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. It's, well, that's a good point. I might not be able to get, yeah, that's, uh, I hadn't thought of it that way, but uh, it's worth it. It's going to be worth it. Uh, it smells, you know, it's a mix. It's, it's a mix. There's still, I can smell sunscreen in there and, uh, and I can smell, uh, you get a, a wide brim hat. You, you, when you're going to deal with the mosquitoes, you spray the outside of your hat, see? Yeah, you don't have to spray your face. And, and uh, uh, this is a waxed cotton hat, but if, if you spray and put enough stuff on those hats, any hat will eventually be waxed cotton. Uh, and, and that's the way it works. But yeah, let me, let me share here um, because we got some pictures to show at some point. Uh, and I'm gonna, and we, got, we have sound, so I'm gonna optimize for the sound. And let's get this thing started. Um, well, and I'm I think we are in. Does that look good? Can we see that? Yep we we yeah uh, we can see um, we can see the whole of the Upper Peninsula. Good deal. Good deal. 
So uh, l- let me start by saying that I'm always happy to talk about fly fishing in general and fly fishing for trout in the Upper Peninsula in, in particular. But before I tell you what this story is about, I-, I need to tell you what it isn't about. And the best way to do that is to read from one of the chapters of my book that, that Will had mentioned. Um, and this is a chapter called Secrets. The Latin word for witness is testes which according to ancient lore arose because male Romans testifying in court were required to place one hand over their jewels as they swore to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thanks to the sensible evolution of modern law, this threat has since weakened to the more reasonable pains and penalties of perjury. But even that's too much for most of us to tolerate. So we fishermen swear no oaths. We lie because people expect us to. But unlike the duplicitous politician with one hand on your shoulder and the other in your pocket, we mean no harm. We revise and stretch the truth to protect our egos and reputations from the woeful certainty that most of our casts do not catch fish. And unless we fish in Lake Wobegon, most of the fish we catch are smaller than average. To paraphrase C.S. Lewis, pride gets no pleasure out of catching some fish, only out of catching more and bigger fish than the next guy. Here in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, another type of fish story protects our secret places, our Shangri-Las, from the harsh reality that the truly great places to fish are great because few people fish them. Understandably, then, the few fortunate fishermen who find these places guard their secrets with the most noble sort of fish story. Do you ever fish the North Branch? No, they lie. So I need to be honest about my lack of honesty when it comes to fishing. I'm not going to tell you about my favorite spots to fish. I can't really do that. You'll need to find most of those on your own or occasionally a good fishing partner take you to a place you thought was just a ditch. They'll launch their canoe and the two of you will catch some of the biggest brook trout of your life. So if I'm not going to tell you about all my honey holes, I might tell you about some of Will's. What exactly is this story going to be about? Well, to explain that, I'll start by sharing some of my experiences from the classes I teach here at Michigan Tech. In 2016, when Glenn Fry passed away, I asked the students in my class to raise their hand if they knew who the Eagles were. Kind of like the responses I often get when I ask if they've read the reading assignment before coming to class, a few tentatively raised their hand. And then I said, well, can you name any people from the band? Nothing. Eventually, someone said, Tom Petty? And I said, no, no, no. He was in a band called Tom Petty. And then another person said, Steve Miller. And I said, no, no, he he was in a band called Steve Miller. And eventually, someone looked it up on their phone and named all the band members, including Joe Walsh. And I tell you this just to show you how naive it is for me to expect my students to recognize any of these people. They never do. Didn't your parents make you watch It's a Wonderful Life, I ask? Get a few shoulder shrugs and with some prompting, a few people might recognize Jimmy Stewart, but rarely do they get Duke Ellington or that guy playing the guitar. Now I do this when I teach about probability and randomness. In particular, it's when I teach my students how to use the rules of probability to determine the chance that they'd be dealt a perfect hand in cribbage. Now, for those of you that don't play the greatest game ever invented, a perfect hand is three fives and a jack that doesn't match the suit of any of those fives and the other five being the cut card. Now we use rules of combinatorics to figure out that the chance of being dealt a perfect hand is one in 216,580. And then based on an average of nine deals in each two person game, I show them things like how to determine the probability that you get three or more perfect hands as a function of the number of games that you play. Then I say, if you wanted to have a 50-50 chance of getting three perfect hands, you'd need to play an average of four games a day for about 55 years. And if you did get three perfect hands, you'd be in an exclusive club with the guy playing guitar there beside Duke Ellington. Now, in addition to getting three perfect hands in cribbage, this guy wrote some wonderful books under the name of Robert Traver, 
which he used partly to honor his mother and partly to honor his deceased brother, but mostly to hide the fact that Marquette County's prosecutor was spending so much of his time fishing and writing books about it. His real name was John Volker. And he did much of the fishing that he wrote about in this beautiful, wonderful part of Michigan's Upper Peninsula in that region between Marquette and Escanaba and spreading a little bit to the east and the west. Early in his career, especially, he loved the main branch of the Escanaba River, especially between the small towns of Princeton and Cornell, where he earned an Ivy League education in trout fishing. Now, he had a law degree from the University of Michigan, so his formal education wasn't too shabby either, but he always seemed to value his, his um, angling education just a little bit more. In fact, when a Life magazine photographer once interviewed him or worked with him on a book, he asked Volker what magical lure there was about trout fishing that would make a presumably intelligent man, one endowed with a four carat legal education, ultimately quit a more or less permanent job on the state's highest court to flee home to taste, chase trout and write yarns about it. Volker answered, just lucky, I guess. And I have to admit that I borrowed that answer when my colleagues asked how I wound up on the faculty of a university in a town that is two miles past the end of earth. Just lucky, I guess. I think it was your talent, Tim. <laughs> you think so, huh? Ah, luck. Um, again, in my book. When I moved to the Upper Peninsula over 25 years ago, the first books I read about fishing in this region were John Volker's Trout Madness and Jerry Dennis's A Place on the Water. Volker taught me about humility. Dennis taught me about hope. Volker was a great trout fisherman, and Dennis still is. At the core of all great fishermen is an understanding of what can and cannot be understood about things that are precious. And the first words I read in the preface for Volker's Trout Madness explain this succinctly. There's a lot of amiable fantasy written about trout fishing, but the truth is that few men know much of anything about the habits of trout and little more about the manner of taking them. And of course, it was this line that inspired the title for my first book. Now my obsession with Volker borders on unhealthy, but in my defense, his professional achievements as a best-selling author and Supreme Court Justice for the state of Michigan, along with his larger-than-life personality and infectious grin, caused Charles Kuralt, a man who made a career out of interviewing great people, to call Volker about the nearest thing to a great man I've ever known. Now, this obsession with Volker's life and stories is sometimes hard for me to understand, and even harder for others especially people that live with me here, to understand about me. But my friend Jerry Dennis summarized it well when he wrote that a man of Volker's intelligence and stature could be so devoted to fishing has been an inspiration to multitudes of the overworked and underrecreated. By his example, he gave us permission to have more fun. Now, Volker famously started most of his fishing days by picking up his mail in the Ishpeming post office waddling over the rainbow bar for a game of cribbage, shooting the breeze with his friends at Congress Pizza, and eventually off to the river. So fishing for him was certainly about more than fish, but he once wrote, I find it difficult to inject drama into a series of fishing stories unless somebody occasionally gets on to a good fish. And I'm here to tell you, he did occasionally get on to a good fish. Beginning in 1936, he recorded daily details about his fishing trips. And one of those details was the number of legal sized fish he caught during each of his outings. Now, he didn't stop fishing in 1970, but this chart will give you some insight into why this guy came to name one of his books, Trout Madness. I can't tell you about all of those seasons, but I would like to share some details about a particular year, 1959. First though, I need to set the stage for that year. Now in the early years of Volker's fishing career and his professional career, he struggled really to find a way to fish nearly every day of the season and still manage a successful and prosperous career. 
perhaps even to the, some have said to the point of depression. But his fishing journal contains a reference to something that happened in 1952 that would ultimately be the key to his fishing freedom. Next day, September 15th, went into murder defense of Lieutenant Peterson. After eight day trial, he was found not guilty by reason of temporary insanity. It turns out he defended a fellow who had murdered a man who he believed had raped his wife. And after that eight day trial, Volker's client was found not guilty by reason of temporary insanity. And Volker believed there was something about that case in his strategy of using the irresistible impulse defense other people might find interesting enough that he wrote a book about it. Now he shopped that manuscript around for the next several years, very, very little luck. But in December of 1956, he learned that St. Martin's Press would publish the book. And what I'm pretty sure was the exact same day Michigan's governor, Soapy Williams, offered him a position on Michigan's Supreme Court. His book was published in 1958. And then in the spring in 1959, Hollywood came to the UP to film a movie based on the book. And when the movie was ultimately nominated for an Academy Award, John Donaldson Volker had pretty much found that fame that would set him free. Volker was 56 years old at the time. By the way, the first time I told this story, I was 56. But that was a little while ago now. Uh, but I'm sticking with that year because I'd like to share with you a brief anatomy of that 1959 fishing season. Now, from Volker's perspective, and maybe from Will's, mine, and a lot of us, there are two types of day in a year. Those that are somewhere, and in his era, that were somewhere between the last Saturday in April and the second Sunday in September, and all the other days that weren't. In other words, there were days when trout season was open and there were days when it was not. And this calendar shows you how he spent those days when it was. I colored the days blue when he fished in a pond or a lake. The ones I colored green are when he fished in a river. And the days he fished both a river and a pond, I shade blue and green. Those white days are the woeful ones that he didn't fish. Now, at first glance, a fishing guide, someone who fishes for a living, they might look at this and say, my goodness, there's an awful lot of white on that calendar. But I'd ask them to keep in mind that until May 16th, he was helping him film the movie. And beyond that, he was still on Michigan Supreme Court. Now, I wasn't born in 1961, even though, you know, I, I got to come back and say something to Will there. You didn't have to say that you were a freshman the year I graduated with my doctorate. That just wasn't called for, but, but that's okay. Um, but everything I can tell you about this came from entries in Volker's detailed fishing journals. He kept spectacular entries of those. Um, and I went to, they're on the archives at Northern Michigan University. Uh, so let's get started. Let's learn about this year. And one thing I'd say is that like an old car, if you remember the old cars with carburetors, uh, summer is like that. And then it takes a long time to get started here in the UP. And so when you look at some of the um, early entries in Volker's journal, they're about things like mushrooms. He actually absolutely loved morels. And the ways winter is so hard on everything up here, animals and plants alike. He also, that year, he had journalists following him, following him around. And this one really caught my attention. I wanted to know what this Don Dooley of the Milwaukee Journal wrote about. And so I went to the online archives and looked for the story in the entertainment section. I didn't find anything there. So then I took a look in this section that was called Men's Summer Clothing and Recreation Section, which is just a ridiculous title. And I tell you, somebody probably got fired soon for their overuse of fonts that put that paper together. But, um, uh, but unfortunately, I just couldn't find it. And you know, all you can find are these scanned uh, pictures of the pages and uh, you can't search for it. So I never did find Dooley's story, but in all of my searching, 
I did learn about America's greatest fishing hole, at least the one in 1959. And these papers were huge and just loaded with things like this. And that made me think about how today a lot of people get upset and think that we are exposing all of our good fishing holes with the internet. But evidently newspapers were the internet before the internet and they did some of the same thing. And if you don't believe me that newspapers were the internet before the internet, even back then, they knew that stories and pictures about cats were essential if you wanted people to follow you. You probably can't read this very closely, but I'm gonna tell you the steps for washing a cat that they put in that story. Step one, lather. Step two, drip. Step three, rinse. And step four, make up for the great trauma that you have inflicted upon your furry friend. I, I should tell you that in, in my search, I did read Don Dooley's 2009 obituary and his daughter spoke about that trip when he came here. She said, my dad was up there covering the filming, a pretty big deal for a small town to have Jimmy Stewart and Otto Preminger. He happened to walk into the lounge of the lodge to find Ellington at the piano, completely alone and working on the soundtrack. The great man saw my dad walk in. My dad asked if it would be all right to listen for a while. And he said, sure, of course, sit down. I used to think until I read that, that the best thing that Don Dooley got to do was interview John Volker, but even all of my um, obsession about Volker, that's a little bit better. Okay, still in May, he wasn't finished with his celebrity meetings. On May 15th, he wrote, mostly postured and posed for movies, John Mealy, role casting, et cetera gave Mrs. S lessons in the same ate lunch and so home. Well, among other things, this John Mealy was famous for his photos of Picasso's light paintings. And Mrs. S was the actress and artist, Gloria Stewart, and she was in town with her husband, Jimmy, who was playing the role of Volker's alter ego in the movie. Eventually, Hollywood left town and he was back to the trout. And on May 29th, he discovered 7X Tippet. He became a bit addicted to this very, very thin tippet. Now, if you're not familiar with what that means, the tippet is the line at the end of a fly fishing rig. Its size is designated by numbers like 4X, 5X, 6X, 7X. The larger number corresponds to finer lines, 7X being four thousandths of an inch in diameter. Now, if you look through Volker's journals, and you see the things he wrote, he often would try out the clever phrases that if you're a fan of his books, you've seen them so many times, many of them are in his notes. You could see when he was trying them out, they wound up in the books. But this one comparing 7X Tippet to the hair of the Scandinavian princess didn't make the cut. Now for you fact checkers out there, human hairs range in diameter from 0.7 to 7 thousandths of an inch. So at 4 thousandths of an inch, he does not get a Pinocchio for saying that they're that fine. Now, the first week in June, you see a bunch of white. That is one of the best weeks for trout fishing in the UP. And I'm amazed as an aside by how many young couples think it's okay to have their wedding during that week. I'm pretty sure most local ordinances in the UP prohibit weddings during deer season. And I've never understood why matrimony is allowed during the first week of June. Now, Volker's issue wasn't a wedding, it turns out. Instead, his fishing got inconvenienced by his obligation to the state of Michigan. To court in Lansing for the shortest court session since I've sat, four days. He wrote that on June 1st. I was curious, what were the cases he had to hear during that trip? So I looked them up. And I was intrigued by this one. Kaufman versus Katz, docket number two, calendar number 47,575, Supreme Court of Michigan. Turns out this fellow named Kaufman bought some barrels from a fellow named Katz. He wanted to put his pickles in them, but when he put the pickles in the barrel, they wound up smelling like some sort of medicinal flavor, and that caused him to lose customers, lose their goodwill and a lot of his pickles. Fortunately for Mr. Kaufman, Volker and his colleagues agreed and he got restitution for those bad pickles. And 
Not surprisingly, the judge got on the next train, and shot right back up to the UP. Now, you might notice you go through these that on Sundays, especially in May and June, he often made it to a pond and a river in the same day. This particular Sunday was interesting because in it, he wrote about visiting a place he called Uncle's. Now, in his books, Trout Manus and Trout Magic, he invented the name Frenchman's to protect this place, but it really was known as Uncle's. The pond is beautiful, and this is a photograph I took of Volker's grandson, Adam, fishing off of one of the many casting platforms that are scattered all around this pond with a connected system of wooden walkways to get you between them. To understand why that is, you can get some insight from my friend James McCullough's book, Volker's Pond. And in it, he wrote this. Walking the shoreline of Frenchman's Pond is like balancing across a floating field of trap doors. The ground is pitted and knelled with old stumps hidden in the grass and clumped with roots and troughed by ancient beaver runs and pocked by muskrat holes. Wading across is impossible. And wading in general is dangerous since stepping past the bank might mean oozing waist deep into jet black boot sucking muck. Just the sort of place Volker was looking for, you see, and was, was evidenced by the next words in his journal, I shall return. In return he did. At some point he bought the place and put a modest cabin on a rocky opening that overlooks the pond. And again, I think my friend James McCullough described it best in his book. He could have hired architects to erect a monumental home on some western river or on a high bank over the Escanaba or Lake Superior. But instead, he and his friends found the only solid flat slab of ground on Frenchman's and built a cedar and pine cabin shaped like a miniature barn, large, barely large enough for four people, cramped with five, tucked between the hemlocks at the bottom of a steep bank, only a stone's throw from the pond. Later in that same week, he went to a river and he wrote about that one. After all these years, I caught my biggest brook trout, 14 and a half inches. 14 and a quarter was the record here to four. Who, I ask, but an attorney would use the word here to four in a fishing journal. Now, you might imagine that I would be interested in this place looking at the journals and you'd be right. And I'm gonna do something I rarely do. I'm gonna show you where it is. So here's a map of that river and I put a star at the place where I believe you caught the fish. Now, if anyone out there, you think you can help me get into that place today, I'll be happy to show you where it is. You see that line running through the image, that little white line, that's an active train track, but it's a long walk from any road. I tried to get in the way Volker used to, but all of his access points are now private and it's, it is miserable to drive a two track deep, deep, deep into the UP only to come to a gate and then have to back way out the way you came in. Um, I did get to a spot a few miles downstream of this one though. And I got a fish that was a few inches off of Volker's record. And as Volker would say, I shall return. Now, the entry on June 29th explains the next three days of no fishing. To, to Detroit with grace for world premiere of anatomy, big deal. When I first read that, I wondered if he was being sarcastic about that. but. If you look at this, this is a picture of United Artists Theater, the theater in Detroit on the opening of that event. And if you can see, I don't know how well you can see, it's not a great picture. There were a lot of people there. So I think he did consider that a big deal. On June 6th, the movie business interrupted his fishing once again. To Chicago to join Otto Preminger, and Otto Preminger is the person who produced and directed the movie version of Anatomy of Murder. And Joe Welch on the censor fight. Now, if you're old enough, you might recall that the way the movie addressed rape was considered to be a little bit over the line by some people at that time. 
one word in particular caused quite a bit of a fuss, and that's why they had to go to Chicago. What exactly was the undergarment just referred to? Panties, Your Honor. Do you expect this subject to come up again? Yes, sir. There's a certain like connotation attached to the word panties. Can we find another name for them? I never heard my wife call them anything else. Mr. Bigler. Oh, I'm a bachelor, Your Honor. That's a great help. Mr. Dancer. I was overseas during the war, Your Honor. I, I learned a French word. I'm afraid that might be slightly suggestive. Most French words are. All right, gentlemen. Back to your places. For the benefit of the jury, but more especially for the spectators, the undergarment referred to in the testimony was, to be exact, Mrs. Mannion's panties. <laughs> The three legal eagles there were played by Jimmy Stewart, Brooks West, and George C. Scott. The judge was played by an attorney named Joseph Welsh, who in 1954 was hired by the United States Army to help defend against the infamous Senator Joseph McCarthy. And when McCarthy repeatedly claimed that one of Welsh's attorneys had ties to a communist organization, Welsh is the person who famously fired back on national TV with, let us not assassinate this lad further, Senator. You have done enough. Have you no sense of decency, sir? At long last, have you left no sense of decency? So with the Michigan Supreme Court justice and an attorney of Joseph Welsh's notoriety, they won the fight and the movie stayed on. Now, July 18th was a monumental day for Trout. On hunch, tied up seven X tipped it again and went to the little pond, lost several square tails. Those of you that don't know, that's a big trout with a, a big square tail. But he got five brook trout, all nine inches and larger. And that's pretty good day of fishing for the judge especially with those 7X tippets. But it was a much better day that same day for fishing down in lower Michigan, because that's the day that several people gathered at George Griffith's home on the Osaba River and formed a group called Trout Unlimited. Today, Trout Unlimited, one of the most important conservation organizations in this country. Locally, we have the Copper Country chapter of Trout Unlimited, and it's Funny because I always have to warn people, if you ever attend one of their spring banquets, um, it's important to understand that a trout unlimited banquet is not a place where you get all the trout you can eat. It means something much, much different than that. All right, let's move to July 26. That was a day he didn't go fishing, but I love the entry. I mean, probably shouldn't post this since I didn't fish. Now, keep in mind, he's writing this for himself. I don't know. He was like the pre-internet era of posting things. Um, but I meant to, he says. Well, I like to categorize my summer days during trout season just like that. Each day is either a day I go fishing or a day I meant to go fishing. And one of those days happened for me when I was hunting down a place Volker had written about in his book. It was a place called Camp Alice that he said was on a Moose Creek. And I wrote a lot about that adventure that didn't involve much fishing. I couldn't find Moose Creek anywhere within 100 miles of Ishpeming. And most of my inquiries about something called Camp Alice came up empty. Dislike for strangers, especially those who have the slightest appearance of a revenuer, is a thing of legend in the Old South, but the backwoods of the Upper Peninsula is still home to many undisclosed distilleries and poaching camps, so selective suspicion is a well-practiced instinct here too. Eventually, though, my persistence paid off and an unusually helpful resident of those woods offered a lead on Camp Alice. Ah, the Camp Alice. Sure, I know this one. She not far from the place where Yanni Smith make the wood for winter. Look here at this map, I show you. Well, my new friend was right. Not only did Johnny Smith make wood for the winter near Camp Alice, it appeared that Johnny Smith now owned Camp Alice. Unfortunately, however, he used some of his wood to make signs, and one of those signs hung on a cable inviting everyone, including me, to keep the hell out of Camp Alice. 
I needed a plan B. According to my plat book, a logging company owned land on the opposite side of Moose Creek. And another map revealed a seasonal road ending within a mile of the creek. The road wasn't gated, but the opening of trout season is typically a week or two before the opening of seasonal roads, and this was, alas, a typical year. Oh well, I plan to return in a few weeks with John Volker's grandson, Adam Soloff, and the road would be open by then. I retreated to Ishpeming for dinner at Congress Pizza, a restaurant and bar founded by John Volker's dear friend, Louis Benetti, the gullible guide in Volker's story, The Voyage. Louis's grandson, Paul, tended the bar and gladly shared stories and old photographs of his grandfather and the judge. By the time I stopped eating pizza, drinking beer, and gawking at those old pictures, I was too tired to search the back roads for a makeshift campsite, so I drove to Marquette and parked my truck in the Walmart parking lot. Nestled between an 18-wheeler and a horse trailer, I wasn't exactly out there, but the bourbon from my old tin cup did taste better. About two hours after I fell asleep, I awoke to the sound and lights of another car settling into an adjacent spot. I raised my head slightly, strained my eyes, but without my glasses, my new neighbors looked like four long-necked aliens with small elongated heads sitting in the space between the two front seats. With my glasses, I saw that the four long necks were legs and the bodies attached to those legs were in the back seat where two normal sized heads were locked in a passionate pre-mating kiss. This, I should have known, is the way adventures work. Sure, you can plan and scheme and try to make things turn out the way you want them to, but the best adventures often unfold at times and in places that you don't expect. You carefully plan and conspire to court the girl of your dreams, then painfully learn that that dream is a nightmare. But when you reluctantly agree to meet your roommate's girlfriend's college friend, even though you're afraid that she's pretty and nice too, probably means she is neither, you fall in love and spend the rest of your life with that girl. Sometimes you just need to show up. I woke at 6 a.m. to the sound of some kid pushing around an electric machine that gathered up shopping carts while my campmate rolled his 18-wheeler slowly toward Highway 41. My naughty neighbor's show had long since ended, so I jumped in the front seat of my truck and drove to McDonald's to eat breakfast and take a pee. After that, I'd paddle upstream and search for my own lost paradise, and I'd try to not miss the ones that are hiding in plain sight. Not much river fishing for Volker in August, but on the 7th, found an hour away from people, had dinner with Ernie and Sonny Miller of Wolverine. Now, Sonny Miller of Wolverine was born Madeline Hemingway, and her brother, Ernest, was another famous Upper Peninsula trout angler who wrote a fishing story called The Big Two-Hearted River. It was actually about the Fox River, and that provides more evidence that we trout anglers don't necessarily want to lie, obfuscate, and misdirect you. We simply have to. Now, Volker liked to hide boats at some of his favorite ponds so he wouldn't have to haul one in and out each time he fished there. And that worked out really well for him, except for the times when it didn't. Porkies had devoured most of my boat, so naturally there was an evening rise of trout out of casting range. If you fish in a, you, anywhere, I suppose, but in a UP, you're gonna learn that porcupines can be bad characters. I once spent a night doing battle with a porcupine that tried to eat a remote cabin where I was sleeping. So I can really relate to that. That porcupine and I fought off and on for about four hours that night until I finally got the thing to run off into the woods. Though if you've ever seen a porcupine run, then you know I'm using a very loose definition of what it means to run. Waddle, shuffle, stagger, waggle, or all of that would probably be much better. But man, did that critter like to eat siding on that cabin. August 21st just might have been the most Volker-esque day of the season. Could have filled the boat with seven to nine inch trout, but held out for the big ones that never came. Just before I quit, Guys in a canoe came along and took a 16 and three quarter inch brook trout right out from under my nose. Found inky camp mushrooms 
gave same and trout to J.B. and Fran Martin, with whom I had supper. Well, the last day of trout season was September 13th. We had a final cookout at Uncle's by firelight. Steaks, wine, and a fifth of sour mash. Good finish. In his chapter about the last day of the season, Volker wrote, Yes, on the last day, we fishermen can try as we may to encant ourselves into hilarity and acceptance, but our hearts are chilled and our minds are numb. For what we fishermen really want is to go fishing, 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 yes, fishing forever into the great far blue beyond. And as I wrote in the last line of my book, I don't know what else there is to say.
Oh, gosh. That brings us to the end of the things I have prepared to talk about. I will be more than happy to talk to anybody. Uh, um, and if anyone wants to get in touch with me, I'll leave that email address there. Uh, more than welcome. Send me a note. I'd love to hear from you. Well, Tim, what an entertaining um, evening so far. Um, there, I want to encourage anyone out there to enter in questions through the Q&A. Use the Q&A feature. We already have um, 10 open questions, and we'll go ahead and start picking Janet, up. should I stop the share? Yeah, go ahead and stop the share. That, okay. That's helpful. And uh, There we go. I'm, I'm just enthralled with um, the story, and I, I did rent... Um, the Jimmy Stewart movie last week in oh, did you? for this. I did. It was oh, very, very enjoyable. Um, That's fascinating. Well, and there's a bunch of bunch of different questions. And Will, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it to you and Tim to kind of pick out the questions and, and I'm gonna mostly just can, listen. Can, but before we start, is it okay for me to say something? Because I'm looking at these questions and um I, I see one from a, a person named Kenneth Foster. And and when I published this book for the first time. Kenneth Foster was uh, one of the first people got in touch with me, wanted a, I, I wanted a, a, a copy of the book and told me just a fascinating story and, and uh, uh, about his, I believe it was his father and Judge Volker. And I don't know if there's a way for him to tell it, but if he, uh, uh, I won't tell the story unless without his permission. And so I'll just leave it at that, but go ahead. I'll let Will get back in charge. All right, and so Kenneth, just write in the Q and A. Write, say yes, Tim. You can you can tell the story, or no, Tim, you can't, because we'll we'll see that coming up soon. So, uh, Tim, this is a question from uh, Joyce Joyce Haxton. Wants to know if there are any bugs up here yet, and I, I can answer that from my experience. I have not yet been bitten this season. How about you? I, I you know, I haven't. Uh... I'll, I'll be put it this way. There aren't any in this office right here because that's where I've been spending most of my time lately. And uh, I rarely get a hatch. And when I do get a hatch in here, I kind of got to stop working and clean something probably. But um, no, Joyce, we uh, uh, I don't know. I, I don't know if we if we have. Uh, the uh, um, uh, by the way, and I, I uh, you know, I want to say something about uh, Joyce and Al. They, they were like. Uh, my version of, of like fishing royalty from Michigan. And uh, I won't tell a lot of this story, but when I was, I finally took my trip to Montana and it's this manuscript I'm putting together, is gonna be there and there's gonna be a good chapter about that. But uh, uh, totally out of surprise, I wound up in uh, on the Madison River, spent a night with as guests of Alan Joyce. They, uh, I ran into some people on the river, gave them a book and they went back and they were with that group. And they said, we got this book from some guy from Michigan and they knew me, they had met me before. So uh, they sent me a note and I got to spend some time with them, it was spectacular. Hope to write a lot about that, but they were married on the river or right next to the river. I, I hope it wasn't in June. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, if you're married, if you get married, at, on the Osable River at Gates Lodge, you can do that anytime. That, that's fine. I'll come to that wedding and I'll, I'll, I'll do anything you want. Yeah. I see. So, so Tim, if you could just briefly uh, mention the titles of the books that you mentioned in your presentation. Oh, the, okay. So, so not my book, the other books. Well, your books too, please. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, uh, the, the, also mine is is the habits of trout actually I, I happen to have so that's this one and uh and then of course the volker books are trout magic the, trout madness and uh and this is one of the the best uh anatomy of a uh fisherman Th this book he was the, the, I mentioned the the photographer Robert Cal Kelly early in the in the presentation, and he was light work for Life Magazine. And they came to do a story for Life Magazine, and um, uh, shocking, the fishermen didn't catch fish, and uh, didn't catch many. In fact, uh, if you look at some of the pictures that are in this book, there's a picture a layout of a bunch of, and I'm tell I'm going to tell the story anyway. There's a bunch of of pictures. Of, of some big trout. They went to the hatchery. You have permission. What's that? You do have permission to tell the story. 
Oh, oh, okay, okay, yeah. Well, and then I'll hope we'll come back to it in a minute. I hope I get it right, but I'll do my best. Uh, but um, uh, anyway, that's a great that that is just loaded, and that came because they didn't ever get the story Life Magazine wanted, but they had spectacular pictures, and this photographer agreed with Volker that it was about much more than whether you're catching fish. It wanted to tell the story of the place. So um, uh, that's a good one. Uh, I, I, I talked about Jerry Dennis's book and, and uh, I'm about to post a story on my blog, uh, uptrout.com, and it uh, potentially will be a chapter in the next book I'm working on. And I'm, I'm gonna write a lot about uh, when I, how I came to be familiar with Jerry's books. Uh, um, a Place on the Water is the, one of the first books that I, I read here. And, you know, you can get any book by Jerry Dennis and you're going to be doing yourself a treat. Um, his books of essays are some of the finest, but his writing about the Great Lakes. In fact, Janet, we need to get him up here and have him be a part of Michigan Tech. I mean, he is a scholar on the Great Lakes and would just be a wonderful person from across campus he, he would touch so many so so much much of our campus uh he's a real michigan michigan treasure um, so i'm posting i'm taking notes and i am posting some of these things so if you are wanting to ah, um to keep up with some of this stuff just go gotcha. to the chat there you go i was looking at and, the question and, and you, answers and you will well you don't need to open that tim but i'm just want yeah. to let people know i've been taking notes and kind of posting stuff in the chat yeah. And then the other book that is just another one, do yourself a favor, is, is uh, Volker's Pond uh, by James McCullough. J James is a spectacular writer, as you saw from some of the, the uh, his, his descriptions of things. It, it just spectacular. Great, great fisherman uh, also. So, uh, yeah, those are uh, books I would recommend anyone to uh, to read about and you'll, you'll get all kinds of Michigan stories Jerry, Jerry's book you know he lived in Marquette and uh one of his chapters is going to is about meeting Volker and uh that's a that's a real treat we're just getting a lot of nice comments like from from Kenneth wonderful presentation Tim thanks very much um and uh, Terry on our board the advisory board would like to know what are your favorite UP fly patterns my favorite UP fly patterns. So, you know, that's a good question. I, the only pattern I fish with that I know of as a, is a UP pattern that I think of as a UP pattern is the Betty McNault. And this is a fly that um, it, if you show that to someone and you tell them it's a, it's a, a, a Betty McNault, they'll, they'll tell you it's a Royal Trude and say it got ripped it off, but it's got its own little differences. And, and if you read Volker's books, he writes a lot about the Betty and he liked to use that fly a lot. And it's a great fly. I use it because it's a UP fly. The other two flies I use the most, uh, I, when dry fly fishing, and that's, if I can dry fly fish, that's what I prefer to do. Um, but the flies I like to use, they're not UP flies, but they are Michigan flies. And it's the Robert's Yellow Drake and Borcher's Drake. Borcher's Drake's a dark fly. Robert's Yellow is a light fly. Um, uh, there's only one fly shop I knew of in Michigan that sold them because there's a former Michigan. Uh, he's been in Montana for so long, Kelly Gallup, but uh, he had them. He has a lot of his own version, but uh, they were spectacular out there and I couldn't buy them anywhere. And I, but I did bring fly tying gear, but that's it. If I, if, if someone said you're going to fish with two flies the rest of your life, I'd get a Borcher's Drake and Robert's Drake. And uh, if the fish don't come to the surface, I guess I wouldn't be able to catch them, but I'd be happy. See, my, my two would be uh, because I, I, I am not a purist. I, I will use a wet fly. Uh, and, and so I, I would, I would choose a partridge in red and an elk hair caddis. Well, and so we have a future student out there, Elijah, um, uh, thanking you, Tim, uh, for your wonderful presentation. I uh, just bought your book. Cannot wait to dig in. I'll be moving to Houghton in May to start at tech. So welcome on board, Elijah. And I could not be more excited to fish the beautiful UP streams. Are there any hatches you like to fish in particular in the area? Uh, yeah, yeah. The, 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 uh, so probably the biggest hatch in the Escanaba system that is, 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 you know, will get your attention is the brown drakes. 
uh, that's that's a biggie. Some of the best evenings I've had down there have been Brown Drake hatches, and um, uh, it's it's uh, that's probably the biggest. The, the problem, you know, a lot of the rivers are here. The the Escanaba will have very consistent the bigger water on the Escanaba from wind down. That's going to have consistent hatches much like a lot of the rivers in lower part of michigan you know you can chase bugs around but um the this area a lot like you know I, I, uh, will mentioned the otter river much less reliable for hatches so a lot of times you know you're going to just kind of stumble onto something and there might be some some bugs hatching but uh but the brown drake that's that's fun and and uh, what i call the sulfurs uh, those are always pretty reliable there too So, Tim, I'm, I'm going to ask this question because by me asking it, I'm going to ask you to answer it because I, I'm the, the question is from an anonymous attendee. How did you learn to cast and what is the secret to doing it right? <laughs> OK, is this Ray Wegelars? <laughs> <laughs> it just says anonymous. Yeah, well, the 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 secret is is uh, I think I, I told that story in Kim's questions. So when we moved to, so I, before I moved to UP, I had fished with the fly rod, but it had been, um, I don't even know what that thing was. A friend of my mom's gave it to me and I would use it for bluegill. I, I wouldn't be surprised if I was tying, trying to tie the fly right to the fly line. I don't know what I was doing, <laughs> but I occasionally catch fish. And then I thought I want to get into fly fishing. And, and my wife, Roxanne, she was at, uh, a art gallery in, in, I believe, up at Calumet, and they were auctioning off goods and services for, uh, to benefit the, the gallery. And, and one of them was fly casting uh, splash fishing lessons. And it was a fellow named Ray Weglars. And, and I, I got to meet Ray. Ray is, is one of the people that founded the Trout Unlimited here in Copper Country. And, um, uh, and I still remember, you know, I was casting and it was a total just it was, he took me up to a pond by his house and it, it was, uh, I still remember, I was like, well, this is, I'm never going to be able to do this. I'm really bad. And I still remember, he said, would it be okay if I come up and put my arms around you? And, and, and I, I said, you just come on, Ray, let's do it. And, but he stood behind me and, and I felt that magic of what that feels like when you make the rod cast. And it's, it, 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 I, I forgot it immediately and it took me a long time but because I saw that once I always knew what I was striving for and um, uh, and I finally got there you know I read a lot of books and eventually I got to the point you know you could catch and we're talking like 25 30 years ago I got to the point I could cast well enough to catch fish but I always wanted it to be better and I would still say you know I'm not no one's going to say wow let, that guy's a great caster but few are going to say I'm really bad, but, uh, <laughs> but anyway, I don't know if I rambled Ray, Ray, Ray Weglar is how I learned to cast fly rod. And, uh, so can we buy the book locally and are any signed copies available, Tim? Um, uh, so let's see. So there's a couple ways uh, I, I should tell everyone. So when I wrote this, I wrote this book to have, I was going to publish, I, I you know, you realize, my gosh, you can publish your own books. I was going to publish a dozen books, give them to my family. And then someday they're going to look at them when they want to know what the heck was the story with that guy. They could read these books and figure it out. And, uh, and I did it and I let people see the book and I got encouragement. They said, publish the book. You should publish that and get it out. So I wound up publishing it. It's self-published. And, um, uh, and, and bookstores, I know that in, in Marquette, Snowbound Books has carried it. I don't know if they, if they have it now, and I would stop in there and sign books for them. Um, locally, uh, one of probably my biggest local seller is our wonderful music store, um, Good Times Music. Bruce Rudman has sold them. Um, he's probably right now mad at me, and I'm going to make a commitment to Bruce. I'm going to take some books to the place tomorrow. And because uh, I know we're out and this whole pandemic, I've been in here all the time. And uh, but um, and then Arnie has sold some. I think he, he's probably out at, and I should probably get him some at um, Downwind Sports. I have books. I'll tell you what, I, if you send me an email and you want, we can exchange a little bit. If you want a personalized book, I'll send you one and we'll just handle the transaction. PayPal, you can send me a check or something. 
I'll do that. I'll do that too. So I have some, I might, I might run out. Uh, I don't know how many I have on stock, but uh, I'll get more. So if anyone wants to send me an email, Schultz, S-C-H-U-L-Z at mtu.edu, I'd be happy to do that. And I'm going to get some more down in Bruce's place for sure. So, so Tim, there was a question. Uh, in and, the and Amazon, you can always get them on Amazon. And if you're local and you were to get one that way and you want to somehow get it to me, I'll be more than happy to sign. Okay, that, that was actually one of the questions in the, uh, in the Q&A was if, if somebody sends you a book at Michigan Tech, will you sign it and send it back to them? Absolutely, would be happy to. So, so Tim, here's a question from John Feldman. And the, most of your presentation was Volcker. Right, which uh -huh. is the which is the Marquette area, and and the question is, how good is the trout fishing east toward the Sioux or west in the UP? So there's no good trout fishing at all west. Uh, <laughs> you you get you start closing in toward Houghton, Michigan. You don't even need to come here. You're not going to catch any trout. I, I would agree with that. Yeah, no, 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 no. It's um, uh, I think there's a lot of good trout fishing, both, you know, Hemingway's story. I made reference to that is the Fox River in the Sini area. You know, he wrote it as the big two hearted river, but uh, that's a spectacular. And you, you drive across the highway there. You're going to see a bunch of boats there. I mean, I think probably the biggest brook trout that get caught in the Upper Peninsula probably get caught in that river. Um, uh, and there's just all kinds of good rivers. The Indian River is a, is a, is a great river. Uh, um, just all kinds. You know, the, 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 to me, the Escanaba, because of the connection to Volcker the, all, and all of the branches, the middle, the east, that's, uh, uh, and the south, you know, that's just the, the west, rather. Those are great rivers. Um, and then you come this way, you know, uh, Will talked about the Otter River. The Otter River system is spectacular. It's a, uh, it can be tough to get into and it's, it's uh, uh, access can be, you're going to have to walk some uh, many times, but that's a great system. There's, there's rivers to, you know, over to the South, the Black River is a great river, but you know, down near the border, that's a beautiful, just beautiful, beautiful river. Um, there's a lot, the Ontonagon, how can I not mention the Ontonagon? The Ontonagon system is, is spectacular. That's another one that's uh there's, you know, I want to say something Will said earlier that um, uh, there's so much good fishing here. It's different though. It's not, it's not like the, you know, the very famous, rightfully so, rivers in southern Michigan, uh, like the Osable and Manistee. But there's good fishing, and 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 one of the things is, you 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 get upset here. You get you get upset there if you're fishing somewhere and you see people. As Will said, we get upset when we see foot tracks, if we see <laughs> at some of our favorite spots. And, and, and what I tell people up here is, is um, too, is don't overlook anything. You know, take a, take, keep a, a thermometer with you. And you, I mean, I, I made this story. I mean, I had a friend, we fished in what I thought was a ditch, a ditch. I'd driven over it many times and we got in there. I couldn't believe the trout fishing. And then he apologized and kind of grumped and said, ah, it's not as good as it should be. I thought, what the heck? <laughs> but <laughs> that's the thing. And there's so many of those. They're everywhere. Um, just, you know, check the temperature. If it's cold temperature, there's, there's trout in it. Um, mm. Yeah. So, so Tim, I, I'll also just mention, so you said that, um, you know, Hemingway's story about the big two hearted river actually took place on the Fox, but the big two hearted river does have trout in it. It's a good river. Which is which is north, you know, north of there. You got to drive a little bit further to get to get there. But and and I personally have not fished the Big Two Hearted, and I count that as a personal failing, mm -hmm. ha having been here in the UP this long. Yeah, yeah. I floated that with a friend in in uh, uh, one fall. It, it, it's 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 beautiful in there. Well, the, there's so many questions, and but this is <clears throat> this is from Jesse. Um, uh, who who seems to be well some basic questions right so when exactly would the fishing season start in the Keweenaw post ice what fish can be caught in these areas again what advice would you give to beginning fishers who have come to the area and are unfamiliar with going out fishing mm -hmm. you know one of the unfortunate things is we don't have a fly shop here 
I, um, you know, where, but uh, now they do have some stuff at, at downwind. And I know Arnie knows about trout fishing and fishing in general. So that's a place, but, but the beauty of a fly shop is it's just a great place to get some advice, get some guidance from, from folks. But um, uh, let me go down a list. So the, the kinds of fish, you can catch anything in this area. Um, you know, there, there's uh, rivers that flow basically through town that have brook trout, rainbow trout. A lot of the rivers have rainbow trout because they come in from as steelhead and then stick around in these rivers. And, uh, and a lot of times, you know, in mid, mid to late summer, you can catch a lot of these rainbows. The lakes are low, depends on what you want to fish for, the lakes are loaded. Um, but, you know, if you want to get into fly fishing, it's, it's I guess, you know, talk to people, um, uh, find people who fly fish and get to know them. That's, that's a great, great way. And uh, read, read a lot about it. It's a, it's a, it's a really difficult but rewarding sport, uh, but it can be challenging. I think a lot of people give up on it because of that. It, it's, it's hard to, uh, to keep going sometimes. And, uh, but yeah, there's just, it's, it's almost a hard question to ask. This is a great place for fishing. When I first came here, before I really got crazy about fishing for trout, I would fish, I would take a, a, uh, a float tube and go right out behind Michigan Tech and catch smallmouth bass. I mean, I'd be floating around right behind campus and catch smallmouth bass and, uh, and walleye. You can get walleye in there too. I kind of was liking get fish on the surface, but, uh, but so Portage Lake is a great fishing lake and there's, there's many, many like it. So Tim, I'll just add, um, actually one of the last comments here is from uh, Cynthia, points out that there is an MTU fishing club. Oh. And, and so if, if, you know, if you're a student and you want to learn how to fish and, or where to fish, I would say that's, um, that's a place where you could start. Well, and to elaborate on that, there are all kinds of student clubs and organizations. I mean, like hundreds, you know, literally. And so the, um, if you are a prospective student or a current student and you want to learn more about kind of things in the area, uh, you know, go to go to the MUB. You're going to find a list of all the student clubs and orgs, and these are um, passionate people who have similar interests. And it, it, I, I strongly encourage that. All right, so Cynthia Hodges wants to know your favorite book, each of you. So think about that. Uh, but I do want to kind of read out a couple, a couple of comments. So. Um, <laughs> some, of these, some of these made me laugh. So Terry, Terry Lane, who's on um, the College Advisory Board, mentions her uncle Hugo tied flies in Newberry. And, uh, and uh, Margaret um, Landsberger points out that wood ticks are already out. We were talking about bugs. And so, yeah, make sure you get, you know, the flea and tick stuff on your dogs if you're going out in the woods. But I was out at the camp this weekend. I didn't see, I, didn't, I really didn't see any insects at this point um, yet. You know, thank God, but um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so favorite, favorite book yeah, besides the ones already mentioned. You going let's start, well? I, I mean, let's start so with it, Tim. Yeah. Yeah. Tim. Oh boy. You know, favorite book. Um, I'm going to keep it on trout or fishing related just because that's the topic here in terms of, of, of books like that. Um, my uh, if you get interested in trout fishing and, and um, uh, in a kind of, if the way I told a story tonight, if that's something that interests you, you got to read all of Nick Lyon's books on fit, trout fishing. Uh, they're just spectacular. Um, you know, but first read John Volker's books, read Robert Traver's books. Uh, cause they're, cause the, the UP connection is so strong in them. But uh, if I had, in terms of, of uh, writing about fishing and, and uh, uh, Nick Lyons, and Nick, Nick Lyons is personally responsible for most of the uh, great literature on fly fishing that's out there. He, he, he was a, um, uh, a publisher, but his books are, I, I reread them. They're, it's, they're just, there's a, there's a real greatness to them. So in fishing, I'd say outside of what I talked about, get some Spring Creek is a great, great book. I would say my favorite fly fishing book, um, which is actually, it's, it's, it's more of a really long short story to, to be honest, 
Is that actually a river runs through it by Norman McLean? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I that that is it's it's interesting. You know, uh, that, that there's so many people that think that that book and the movie that came after it are about fishing, and, and they're not. That's a that is about life. And uh, by the way, that book comes in, uh, or that story comes in uh, the book with two, two two or three stories in it typically. And uh, I forget the name of uh, the, the, the one about his time. It's partly mostly fiction, but um, uh, as a, uh, you know, working in the, uh, uh, in the, in the hills of the logging that I think, I hate, I know it's blasphemy on a, on a, uh, a talk about fishing, but that might be better than river runs through it. And it's all in the same little book. So well worth getting. Actually, Tim, you might, and, and uh, the audience as well, you might be interested. I, there's a there was an essay that I read that Norman McLean wrote when he was faculty at the University of Chicago playing pool with Michelson of the famous Michelson Morley experiments. Oh, really? <laughs> and and he what really struck me was they go into this pool hall and this was back in the days where professors had to be suit and tie and the whole bit and Michelson's his his compromise to being in a pool hall which by the way he really enjoyed he took his jacket off <laughs> and he played pool and and mclean's comment was he wasn't he wasn't good enough to hustle but he was just short of it <laughs> oh that's great all right we are running up i've called a hard stop on husky bites it's 7.15, we're, we're coming up on the hour. So I'll going to say just a few closing remarks. Can, and then can I tell pass. the story about Kenneth? <laughs> uh, the, the one that I said, I, I'll do oh, it real okay. fast. I, mean, right. I, I just hate to leave a loose, loose end Yes, on yes, yes. You should so, tell that story. And, and this is all my, my memory of this, of what he had told me. I should have looked it up uh, today because I did, did think about it. But the, the short story, and I apologize if I get it wrong. It's a good story either way. But um, his, his father was, was on a train heading from the UP to lower Michigan. And he's sitting next to this gentleman who's got a suit on. And um, they happened to, his father had, a, I believe it was his father had a, a little bottle of whiskey to get him through the trip. And so they started sharing it and chatting. And before long, they had finished it off. And, uh, and the other person, uh, he reaches into his jacket and said, I hadn't really wanted to do the get into this one, but he pulls his out and they enjoy that. I mean, it's a long train ride down to, from the upper peninsula. But he gets checked in in Lansing, and uh, and the next day, or even maybe even that day, after this fellow he had talked with the whole way down, drank a couple bottles with, um, uh, he had no idea until he turned on the TV, and it's John Volker being sworn in to the Supreme Court of Michigan. <laughs> and he said the guy didn't say a word about it the whole time. Uh, that's John Volker. Well, and there's just some. Great questions left to still answer. So I'm gonna um, I'm gonna kind of run a tiny bit over. I hope I hope people will forgive me. So Marnie asks, does the Copper Country Trout Unlimited hold any casting clinics? Do you guys know? Oh, I don't know. Uh, I haven't been as active with it, but uh, I would love to do casting clinics personally. And uh, you know, I'm not gonna do it, but maybe either with one of the local businesses or through trout. I, I know they have days down on the lake. So something does happen sometimes. Well, there's an opportunity for an ambitious person to kind of like set up some, some casting clinics and people want to know what your favorite kind of rod and fly is. I think that kind of belongs in a casting clinic. Um, and <laughs> I'm gonna answer John's question in a, in a minute, but you guys should think of your closing remarks um, starting with Will and then and then uh, Tim, you're going to close us out. Uh, so many, just so many thanks and kudos. Um, a lot of people really, really, really en enjoyed um, enjoyed this. So, um, um, where was the one? It was about a bug. Who is the one that answered asked the question about the? Can you find that one, Will? Janet, will will, there, will I be able to see all of these questions later so I can see? No, they they kind of disappear. Um, oh, the I'm ones sorry that we've been that. reading out. I know, I know. Well, I don't well, know how we just can say that. Make sure people maybe, know. send me an maybe, email if you want. Yes. Yeah. And and his email is schultz at mtu.edu, which is s c h u l z, no z, z in there, just z. 
Well, I'm going to just answer John Sawyering's question because my son, I was driving around with my son and he's like, oh, mom, there's 5G in the area. So I, I, I believe there is 5G in the area, but I don't know anything about how many telecom com com companies are installing 5G cell data service. But my son assured me that it, as we, I was driving up on, on Sharon, there was 5G. So can you, Tim, do you know anything more about this? You're in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Yeah, I I, uh, I don't know. That that's uh, <laughs> so that's... the latest intel we have is from my son. Is is what I'm telling okay. the community. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us uh, for Husky Bites. We have three remaining Husky Bites for, for spring of the year 2021. Uh, it has been wonderful spending time with you this evening. This is Michigan Technological University's. Um, webinar series that has been recorded and posted. And if you miss any of them, you can catch up later. This is um, the College of Engineering Dean uh, Janet Callahan kind of passing it to Will, my co-host, to say a few closing remarks and then Tim to close down the evening. Thanks, Janet. And thanks, thanks again for inviting me to be a part of this. Uh, as I said, I hadn't seen Tim's presentation, so that was a real treat for me to follow along with that. And it's just great to interact with everybody out there throw in questions about, I mean, something that uh, obviously both Tim and I love to do and are looking forward to uh, doing here pretty shortly. It's, it's I'm, you know, I'm looking out my window and I can see some bare ground, which means the bugs will be coming out soon and the fish will start rising. Tim. Well, thank you. Thank you, Janet, for asking me to do this. I, I uh, um, I had done this a few times for when the book came out at a couple of places, uh, but um, this is a little bit different. The, the, I put some ex different things in it, and uh, um, I just would have to say I never really imagined that as a professor here at Michigan Tech, I'd get to talk about fly fishing uh, in, in general and, and uh, about uh, um, John Volker, who just always admired so much in so many ways and really influenced me in, in the way I view the outdoors. So thank you for letting me have that chance uh, to do that. And thank all of you. I, I, I'm just shocked. I, when you asked me to do it about fishing, uh, I thought, well, I guess, but I mean, no one will show up, but it's been a, I see the participants. I'm just really, really, really happy to see. And I, I hope people enjoyed it. Uh, it was really, really a pleasure for me to do it. Um, and uh, if anybody wants to talk more, I would be more than happy. Just send me an email. Uh, I'd love to hear from you. Well, and, and thanks again, everyone. We've answered 32 live questions. We still have 17 open questions. I kind of feel bad, but I know that people need to kind of go and eat their dinner. So thank you, everyone. Please join us next week. I'm looking forward to um, seeing you again. Good evening. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>